Norman Hall said he was 12 years old, but in reality, records show he was only eight years old. Captain H.B. Mecklehem was the agent of the Massachusetts Mill in Lindell, Georgia from the late 1800s to 1937. That's when Norman was a child working in his mills. The captain lived in a big house away from the mill village in Lindell, but Norman lived right in the middle of the mill village and Park Avenue. The house still stands today. Norman and the captain lived parallel lives and they both represent the paternalistic system that was so prevalent in the cotton mill era. North Georgia native and southern journalist Henry W. Grady was invited to speak, but he didn't want to. The New England Society of New York City had invited him. The members selected him because they had read his columns that were informed, conservative, and industry-friendly. On December 22, 1886, in the crowded Demolico restaurant, Grady was on the roster to speak, but not until General William Tecumseh Sherman had had his say at the podium. And just after he finished, the band played Marching Through Georgia. Now the antagonistic mood was set for Grady to talk about the New South. Grady began with a quote, There was a South of slavery and succession. That South is dead. There is a South of union and freedom. That South thank God, is living and breathing and growing every hour. Grady quoted Benjamin H. Hill of Tammany Hall in 1886 and went on to describe the South of Reconstruction. He used vivid images of northern soldiers and southern soldiers returning home. One comes home to plenty of work in a home that he remembered, and the other one comes home to poverty and destroyed homes. Grady shared the attitude of most defeated southerners when he quoted Georgia author Bill Arp. Well, I killed as many of, the, of them as they killed of me, and now I'm going to work. Grady noted there's a new South, not through protest against the old, but because of a new conditions, new adjustments, and if you please, new ideas and aspirations. He pointed out that the Southern cotton crop brought in $400 million annually, and noted that if the people produced textiles near the crop, they would get rich. He reminded them of dropped interest rates from, for industry from 24 to 6%. Grady told the Northern industrialists that the path was smooth and the Mason-Dixie line was erased. He mentioned the Negro problem, but assured them that that was under control, an overestimate on Grady's part. After his 30-minute speech, he was welcomed with cheers and applause and the audience of more than 300 were big names like Henry Flagler and J.P. Morgan. The cotton mills were moving south, bringing the mills to the cotton fields. The time was ripe. While there had been cotton mills before the Civil War, the era of the textile mill in the south had begun. Only a few mills operated in North Georgia before 1880, Tryon, Roswell, and New Manchester. They were running and it had company-sponsored housing. By the, late 18, by the late 1910s and the early 1920s, the south had overproduced New England. The mills had moved south, just as Grady had suggested in his 1886 speech. The area called the Southern Piedmont stretched from Virginia to Alabama. Mills popped up in large urban areas and in towns like Rome and Dalton and Canton and Cartersville and Tryon. By the 1920s, textile mills had become the largest employer of North Georgia. The allure of regular wages was way too strong for the farmers working on failed land. Images of North Georgia in the early 19, 1900s was of black and white canyons from soil erosion. According to Tipley of University of California, nearly 10 million acres were in cultivated row crops and much of that land was losing soil in every rain. The Piedmont lost an average of about seven inches of topsoil, but in many places all of it was lost. The resulting red hills were both evidence and the heritage of the generation of land mismanagement. The land was ruined for farming. When land was cheap and unlimited in North Georgia after the land lottery, the land was treated as expendable. But this was the beginning of paternalism.
farmers looked elsewhere for income. At the same time, textile mills were flush with new technologies that increased production. They needed new hands to work the new machinery, so the North Georgia mills lured families from the farm with low-rent homes, with modern upgrades like water in the house, or near the house, and later indoor plumbing and electricity would eventually be added, all for the low price of 25 cents per room per week. The entire family, however, was expected to work in the mill, even the children. So the merchants also tightened credit in the late 1800s, making it impossible for the economically distressed farmers to get out of the red clay and financial holes. Some scholars compare paternalism in the textile mills to the slave-master relationship, but that is a metaphor that does not truly work for the situation. Paternalism was a system that allowed the mill owners to attract failing farmers and poor southerners by offering them a home and a community as part of the job. Paternalism had a downside. Like children mill workers and the big brother control over the workers at home, and eventually paternalism did crumble. Douglas Fleming noted that the paternalistic system was weak, without foundation, and would fall apart under certain conditions. And those conditions eventually happened. When the mill operators decided to introduce production science, they created the dreaded stretch-out system. Workers were let go, and the remaining operators had to run more than machines than fast at a faster pace. And the far family systems also started to break down. By the early 1920s, labor unions had started to move south and focus on the textile mill. See, the whole family worked in the mill because just one wet wage earner was not enough. In the early 1900s, children were young enough at eight to work in the mills. The younger children did their part by dressing up in their Sunday best and filling lunch baskets to the, and selling lunch to the other uh, workers at noon. Between 1880 and 1910, roughly a quarter of all textile workers were then under the age of 16. So, social reformer Louis W. Hine and the National Child Labor Committee, the NCLC, worked hard to stop this practice, but it continued into the New Deal and those New Deal laws finally ended child labor laws. When you look at Norman from Lindale, pictures like his were brought to Congress and they made preliminary laws 
about child labor when people were made aware. But even though the laws started, children did not disappear from the mills in the South until economic conditions and technological advancements made their labor more expensive than that of adults. Baseball was a big deal in the Texta era. Almost every mill village in North Georgia had a baseball team. This was not amateur play. Many of these Mill villagers went to play for the big leagues. The players were serious, and mill owners recruited players just to play rather than to work, or they hired players to do easy jobs like village painting so that they could be fresh on game day. The competition was fierce, especially in the Northwest Georgia Textile League. Shannon managers wanted to donate part of their wages to recruit Rudy York from ADCO. Lefty Sproul played for Goodyear in Rockmart, but he spent many seasons moving around the southeastern baseball. He was hard to get a hit off, according to his granddaughter, Beth Gibbons. The company constructed recreation areas and sponsored activities like baseball, bowling, scouting. But baseball was a big deal in the mill villages. The mill owners built the baseball fields and added lights. They created events in the village each Saturday after work. The mill owners supported textile baseball recruiting and catering to the baseball players. The players were even good jobs, but the real purpose was to win, was win the ball games. Why did the mills invest so much of their, into their baseball teams? According to historian Heather Shores, many scholars felt that the management wanted to promote teamwork, even to keep the busy workers busy and avoid unionization. Others felt it was about players learning about mill life, especially immigrants and former far farmers. It may have just been another way for the, to keep the players in the village by paying them extra wages. During the Great Depression, players made 12 to $14 per week for mill work and an extra 4 or 7 for playing baseball. The higher te salaries tended to keep the play players in the mill. Game day was a big event. Beth Gibbons remembers her grandmother telling her about their, she and her sisters um, wouldn't think of going to a ball game without their dresses and their hats and their gloves. And in the community, you only dated baseball players. But the rules changed a lot during the league. But one rule was constant. Every player had to be a mill employee. And the mill employee had to be white. African Americans had their own teams. And the two never mixed. Many textile ball players went on to play professionally. But at ADCO, one of the greats played each Saturday after the mill closed for the week. And the people came to the grandstands to watch Rudy York. The home run king, Preston Rudolph York, Rudy York, began his baseball career in 1929 at the age of 15 on the baseball fields of ADCO. According to the Etowah Valley Historical Society, the Super Twisters, one of the founding members of the Northwest Georgia Textile League, in 1931, an independent semi-pro league that included a number of teams from mill towns in the surrounding area. In 1937, Rudy York was on the lineup at third baseman for the Detroit Tigers. He was benched during the season due to poor play, but eventually moved to the catcher spot so he could bat. In 1937, Rudy York was on the lineup as a third baseman for the Detroit Tigers opening day. He went on to break many home run records. He played for the Boston Red Sox, the Chicago White Sox, and the Philadelphia Athletics. He played 13 years in the major leagues. He was released from the athletics but stayed in the game by managing minor league teams, coaching first base, and even playing semi-pro ball. He died in 1970, and Governor Jimmy Carter declared August 17th to be Rudy York Day in Georgia. The next time you're at the Rome Bray Stadium, go see the monument to the Textile Leagues, placed there by historian Heather Shores. It's a series of posters telling about the, the Northwest Georgia's Textile League. Another part of mill life was the company store. Tryon Mills had the big, friendly. Other stores, like in Atco, were owned by outsiders but leased by the mill. They all had different ways of uh, paying blue books, tokens, chips. Uh, but for the most part, like the Ernest Tubbs song, most people sold their souls to the company store. Sometimes they would come out owing the, the, the company more money than they had made. Telling the textile mill era story requires an honest look at the strikes that erupted. Each mill had its own version of strikes and labor disputes. But the big one was in 1934, 
many of the North Georgia uh, mills were involved in Tryon Mill. There were deaths, there were shootings. And the, it all started because Daddy decided uh, they were getting tired of the Daddy rule and them speeding up the line and the layoffs and the treatment and the control. And when they started to unionize, they even had spies at Fulton Bag Company and other places to make sure that the the strike the unions wouldn't come in and push up the wages for the people in the mill. The strike of 1934 was so bad that there was actually people, women mostly, and children imprisoned in a concentration camp that was used during World War One for German soldiers um, to to gather up the rebel rousers that stirred up the um, the workers. And they were put in, like I said, a prison camp by the National Guard, according to the um, government, to the governor. The mill supported the war effort by winning Navy E awards for people selling bonds and supporting. But when the men came home from the war, they had seen some things. And cars were becoming more affordable. So they no longer needed to live in the mill village to work in the mill. In fact, many of them never came back to the mill at all. With the strikes continuing and people moving out of the village, they began selling the houses uh, to the renters. Some of the houses were sold to landlords who didn't always maintain their property. Uh, everything started to shut down and it didn't help much with foreign markets where it was cheaper to produce because of... So, most of the mills began closing or repurposing themselves. Very few mills still exist today. Tryon Mill still exists making blue jean material, denim material. There's other mills that still the Goodyear plant in Polk County. They're still milling, running, but they're not a cotton mill. But the building looks sturdy. Some of the other buildings are just falling apart. But the purpose and the time of that the Mill Village era is over. At the east end of town, at the foot of the hill, there's a chimney so tall that says Aragon Mill. And the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind as it blows through the town. Weave and spin, weave and spin But there's no smoke at all Coming out of the stack For the mill has pulled out And it ain't coming back And the only tune I hear Is the sound Blows through the town, weave and spin, weave and spin. Now I'm too old to change, and I'm too young to die, and there's no my old man and I and the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind as it blows through the town weave and spin weave and spin children at all in the narrow empty streets now the looms have all gone it's so quiet I can't sleep and the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind 
As it blows through the town, weave and spin, weave and spin. Now the mill is shut down, it's the only life I know. Tell me where will I go? Tell me where will I go? And the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind as it blows through the town. Weave and spin, weave and spin.